Welcome to the House uh, Committee on Corporations. Today is Monday, March 29th. We are in room 35 of the State House. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairman Solomon. Here. First Vice Chair O'Brien. Here. Second Vice Chair Caldwell. Present. Representative Casey. Representative Chippendale. Present. Representative Fenton Fung. Present. Representative Hawkins. Present. Representative Kazarian. Here. Representative Kennedy. Present. Representative Lima Charlene. Present. Representative Stephen Lima. Present. Representative Phillips. Present. Representative Potter. Present. Representative Serpa. And Representative Shalcross Smith. Chairman, there is a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we have 13 bills on the calendar today. Uh, so I look for a motion to hold all bills for further study. So moved. Made by uh, Vice Chair O'Brien, seconded by Second. Vice, Chair, Vice Chair Caldwell. Will the clerk please take the roll? Chairman Solomon. Yes. First Vice Chair O'Brien. Yes. Second Vice Chair Caldwell. Yes. Uh, Representative Chippendale. Aye. Representative Fenton Fung. Aye. Representative Hawkins. Aye. Representative Kazarian. Aye. Representative Kennedy. Yes. Representative Charlene Lima. Representative Aye. Stephen Lima. Yes. Representative Phillips. Yes. Representative Potter. Aye. Chairman, the motion passes 12 to 0. Great. So we have 13 bills on the calendar today. We've received a significant amount of written testimony on this, these bills. Uh, additionally, we have received, uh, we have some individuals who will be testifying on the 13 bills. Uh, I would ask that the those testifying try to limit your testimony to three minutes and try to include anything that may not have been included in your written testimony. So uh, the first bill we will take up is by Representative Hawkins. It's five uh, House Bill 5958. This bill would provide the nonprofit dental service corporations to have the power to provide for the administering and ensuring of vision and optometric, optima, optometric programs. Representative Hawkins. Thank you, Chairman Solomon. Um, real, real brief on this bill. Um, H five nine five eight has been introduced. Uh, for the purpose of clarifying ambiguity in the Nonprofit Dental Service Corporation Act, Rhode Island General Laws 27 20 one the enable, in, enabling legislation under the, which Delta Delta was chartered in 1959. While this act provides for a long list of health benefits and programs that Delta Dental can, can provide alongside dental ensure administer and it is less than completely clear that this includes ensuring vision care products provided providing vision care products is increasingly common amongst delta dentals competitors and for other delta dental and blue cross blue shield plans around the country um, i understand there is some uh verbal testimony coming on so with that, I will leave it to the phone call. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from Representative Hawkins? Seeing none, we will go first up to William Landry from Delta Dental of Rhode Island. No answer. Okay, uh, we've called Mr. Landry from Delta Dental, and there's no answer on the line. Um, we have received written testimony from Delta Dental of Rhode Island in favor of this legislation, and as such, uh, that concludes the hearing on House Bill 5958. Next up, next up, we will take up House Bill 5964 by Representative Stephen Lima, the Rhode Island Salvage Law. This bill would eliminate the notarization requirement for various certificates filed by insurance companies. Representative Stephen Lima. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. <clears throat> this is just a bill that would eliminate the, the 
um, Little Republic to be physically in front of somebody and be able to do it virtual. Obviously, with the past year that we've had, a lot of things have gone more virtual, and this is just one more. All right, are there any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Um, we will go first to Frank O'Brien from the APCIA. Frank, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Frank O'Brien with the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. This is a particular piece of legislation that we asked uh, to be filed. It comes out of our experience with the pandemic. Uh, Rhode Island DMV requires certain forms to be notarized. We ran into a problem actually getting people to notarize uh, forms during the course of the pandemic. Uh, we're currently in discussions with Rhode Island DMV on this and other issues. And while we are supportive of the bill, we'd ask the committee to hold this for further study as we work things out with DMV. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, Frank. Uh, we have received written testimony in favor from the insurance auto auctions, the APCIA, uh, and we have received written testimony against from the DMV. I believe they had some concerns with the language and other things on the bills. So that concludes the hearing on House Bill 5964. Next up, we will take Representative Tabone's bill, which is House Bill 5446. This would uh, exempt post-use polymers in recovered feedstocks used in advanced recycling processes from the definition of solid waste. Representative Tabone. Good evening, uh, uh, Chairman Solomon and members. I'm here to present uh, a very special bill, I believe, that will makes a lot of sense for the people of Rhode Island in regards to creating jobs and more importantly lessening our carbon footprint long term. Uh, I know there's some controversy around uh, the, the use of um, advanced recycling uh, as uh, Representative Caldwell is currently facing our community, but this is a little different. This is not medical. This is more about uh, utilizing this technology that doesn't burn. The word that they're using a lot is burn. This heats up the the plastics it melts it and therefore you could reutilize you could utilize it once more in different ways uh, that I'm sure that the the test uh, the people who will be testifying after me uh, can go into uh, a further conversation what I'm trying to do here is introduce something that uh, the plastics that are usually uh, accumulating in the landfill that are not recyclable, uh, this would be the type of plastic that uh, this technology of advanced recycling would support us in. It would allow for many products to come out of it. And we're either going to get plastic in the front end or the back end. If we're, if we're, use, if we're producing plastic in the front end, it's going to require more fossil fuels to be able to put in, um, make, make, it, make them and then put them in the market. Again, this would recycle, this would utilize it once more, and more importantly, bring many jobs to Rhode Island and new revenue to our state that we haven't seen without really causing much environmental harm. Is there, is there harm? I'm sure there's something. There's nothing that goes, but for now, I believe that uh, this, um, this proposal makes a lot of sense, and at this time, I'm happy to uh, uh, take some questions. Thank you, Vice Chair O'Brien. This is also, uh, which I'm very aware of this technology, uh, uh, just like you said, it'll be minor harm to the environment, but also what, what would be a significant benefit, it would extend our landfill for maybe 10 to 15 years if we pass this. I, I think that's a great point, uh, Representative O'Brien. We, we recently, just a few years ago, we increased the tipping fees. We doubled or tripled them because people were conveniently throwing everything away. 
Uh, by increasing the tipping fees, cities were forced to re-educate uh, their residents uh, because we were seeing that our landfill was going to be uh, pretty much shutting down in, within the next 10 years. We've doubled that now, but we'll probably be talking about that issue very soon, once again. And the other alternative was that they were going to put it in rails and take it to the middle of the country. Now, my community, as many of you guys supported me, a few years back was facing that through uh, the use of our transfer stations and we have several other transfer stations around the state that uh, nobody is raising their hand to say bring the next landfill here so again we need to think of there's there's a cost to everything but the long term is what are the benefits for rhode island and i think this is a great option are there any other questions for the sponsor seeing none we will go to Craig Cookson from the American Chemistry. Craig, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Chairman Solomon and members of the committee. My name is Craig Cookson. I'm the Senior Director of Recycling and Recovery at the American Chemistry Council's Plastics Division. The American Chemistry Council represents the leading companies in the business of chemistry. I'm here today to speak in support of H5446. In 2018, U.S. plastic resin manufacturers announced a goal that by 2040, 100% of plastics packaging would be reused, recycled, or recovered. Advanced recycling, also known as chemical diversion or chemical recycling, will play a critical role in meeting that goal. <clears throat> so right now, Rhode Island and much of the United States does a fairly good job of mechanically recycling our soda and water bottles, as well as milk jugs and detergent bottles and some tubs and lids. However, it's challenging to mechanically recycle complexly engineered packaging that greatly reduces food waste and keeps our food sanitary and fresh. These include multi-layered pouches, cheese packaging, coffee lids, and rigid containers. However, instead of burying these valuable plastic resources in a landfill, thanks to advanced recycling, they can be economically recycled and converted to a versatile mix of products, including feedstocks for new chemicals, plastics, waxes, lubricants, coatings, and many other products of chemistry. And let me state clearly for the record what these technologies are not. They are not incineration. For example, in pyrolysis, solid plastics are heated in the absence of oxygen, so there's no combustion, and then are continued to be heated until they turn into gas vapors, where then they are cooled, condensed, and converted into feedstocks for a variety of new products. Over 400 global brands have committed to using specific amounts of recycled content plastics in their packaging, and advanced recycling is the enabler to help them achieve that. Finally, it's important to also discuss how these technologies are and will be regulated. As manufacturers, they are subject to a litany of federal, state, and local environmental regulations, including the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act, the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, and many others. So when claims are made about these technologies being unregulated or having toxic emissions, those claims are simply not accurate, and it's misinformation. <clears throat> a facility has to comply with these state and federal regulations. So it's important to state that any facility doing business in Rhode Island would need a litany of permits from the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, as well as any required municipal permits. Folks testifying later are going to make the claim that these technologies release toxic products in the environment. Two things to note here. Just recently, Good Company, an environmental consultant based in Oregon, released a study that looked at the air emissions generated by advanced recycling companies, and the study found that the emissions are low, and in fact, lower than facilities such as food manufacturers and institutions like universities and hospitals. Additionally, it's also critical to recognize that any product these technologies produce, whether a chemical or plastic feedstock, <clears throat> or even a fuel, has to meet the most stringent specifications to be used in the marketplace. If the products of advanced recycling don't meet stringent specifications, they either won't find buyers in the marketplace. So this is a very well-engineered process. So in closing, the opportunity to recycle more types, as Representative just said, and greater amounts of plastics using technological innovation is an exciting frontier. In fact, 10 states have passed legislation encouraging these technologies to take up root in their states because policymakers like yourselves want to see proactive solutions to ending plastic waste. Just today, in fact, Virginia Governor, Virginia's Governor Ralph Northam signed Virginia's SB 1164 into law. This legislation, which is almost identical to H5446, passed the House of Delegates 90 to 8 and the Senate 34 to 4. I ask that you support H5446, that we work together to find common sense solutions to plastic waste, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Chippendale. Thank you, Chairman. So I, I love this idea. I love that we will extend the life of the landfill and we'll actually be able to reuse the polymers that are otherwise just being thrown away and taking up land. 
but you sound like you're very technical, technically aware of the process. So when I was reading this bill earlier, it is, it's a fairly um, a complex bill. When I was reading the bill earlier, I was just wondering to myself, and, and you stated that there are no um, issues regarding hazardous chemicals. So whether it's the gasification process or the solvination process, we're, we're introducing and creating in the case of adding solvents, you know, some of them are, are petroleum-based solvents. Um, in gasification, we are separating. There will be a production or a, or, a, or a separation of the various petroleum products that may have been used. So there's got to be an element of control in these systems. I'm wondering, are these self-contained, uh, the, the facilities that do this process, the, this, this type of recycling, are they self-contained? Do they have scrubbers to recycle the air that, from these various processes that, it's, it, it, that they're engaged in? And is the ultimate final waste product something that can be safely disposed of? Yeah, so good question. Um, <clears throat> so number one is these technologies are going to first sort of manage their feedstock, right? Like any manufacturer, their feedstock or raw material. So like any manufacturer, they're going to make sure that the plastics they take in the front end meet a specification. So they're going to make sure that essentially they're getting polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene. Um, if there are some residue or contaminants um, uh, with those plastics, they will, uh, you know, the, the systems all have a prioritary, uh, proprietary process for removing any um, contaminants. Um, chlorine, for example, is a, a product that, uh, you know, is going to come in in very small amounts, um, but they can, the, there's, all, there's a process proprietary, again, to the technologies to keep that isolated. Um, and then on the back end, the plastics, yes, have to meet a specification, right? Um, chemical manufacturers, plastics manufacturers, a fuel blender, you know, those products have to meet very strict specifications. And so those, the, the products coming out of here have to meet a strict, strict specification. What is usually left over from um, these, these products is a char, and the char is basically a, a, like a carbon black. You know, they're trying to find uses for it, whether it can be used, to, you know, in the production of tires um, or as a carbon black, but it can be safely um, landfilled. The, 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 the final part is some of the gases don't condense um, down to liquid hydrocarbons. They use those gases as a, as a process energy, so you're displacing, let's say, virgin natural gas or, or you know, a virgin resource to, to power the facility. So the facility actually um, uh, runs on its own energy, essentially. And then, yes, there are scrubbers that make sure that you know, limits any sort of emissions to the air. And just one last word is we um, just released, as I mentioned in, in my testimony uh, several weeks ago, was a company by Good Company that really goes in depth about the emissions from these technologies. And the, at, that these emissions are very low, um, well under the EPA Title V thresholds, and also lower, again, than things like food manufacturing, universities, hospitals, and other institutions. Thank you very much for that extremely comprehensive answer. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, <coughs> Vice Chair Caldwell. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Justine Caldwell. So um, as Representative Tabone noted, in my community, uh, a company is trying to bring a high heat uh, uh, burning, <laughs> a, a medical waste facility uh, to East Greenwich and West Warwick. Um, you know, and I just want to point out a couple things, which is that, you know, the people in my district and in West Warwick are really united that they do not want these kind of facilities here in Rhode Island. Um, there is bipartisan agreement for that. You know, one of the plus sides people know is that it brings jobs, but we don't want to bring jobs to Rhode Island that expose employees to uh, toxic chemicals or anything like that. And, you know, in Rhode Island, we are getting away from burning plastics or high heating plastics or melting plastics or whatever phrase you want to use to talk about how you are going to dispose of those plastics or advance recycle them. You know, Rhode Island as a state has started to move away from that very successfully. And I, I don't see why we would go backwards in that and start bringing plastic here um, to heat it. That, that's that's sure. not really thank, a question. Thank you go ahead. No, no, uh, yeah, sorry, um, I, it's hard to see, so, well, I can't see anything, so um, sorry if I interrupted you, but um, sorry, want me to answer? Or, uh, sure, you didn't you interrupt have? me, yes, we can't see each other, I was kind of just rambling at the end, I was finished, thank you. 
No problem. Um, so first of all, I just I just want to make sure that yeah, there's some clarification there that that this bill fifty four forty six is totally unrelated to you know the, this discussion over the medical waste um, disposal, um, and and I think that's kind of the key term that you use. Is it sounds like that, and I to be honest don't know that much about it. Sounds like it's working to dispose of this material, whereas what these technologies are are manufacturing. So they're taking plastics. And again, in the absence of oxygen, so there's no incineration, there's no combustion. They're heating the plastics until they melt. They continue to heat them until they they essentially turn into gas vapors and then cool and condense them back into these liquid products. Now, the benefit of that is for mechanical recycled plastics, where they just essentially melt plastics and then turn them back into new plastic pellets again, you know, detergent bottles and milk jugs and things can go into products like um, railroad ties and uh, plastic decking. Uh, water bottles can go into fleece jackets and things like this, things like that. But what these, what this process enables is the plastics are taken basically back to their basic chemical or molecular state, and therefore they can be rebuilt into new plastics again. So we're seeing companies like Unilever um, in their Magnum ice cream tubs, which they're selling right now in Europe, that are made from plastics derived from this process, so food contact plastics. Um, Mondelez in their iconic Philly cream cheese tub, um, is is uh, is is going to be made from recycled plastics using these technologies in the U.S. Here, uh, Nalgene water bottles, the reusable water bottle, Eastman is breaking down used plastics and turning it back into the polymers that go into these Nalgene water bottles. And we found that uh, you know an analysis by Close Loop Partners that there's a 120 billion dollar economic opportunity here in the U.S. So I, I just I want to make sure it's it's clear to the, to the members of the committee that this technology is all about remanufacturing and recycling and getting these plastics back into their highest and best use, and that is totally, you know, separate or different um, than sort of taking material and it sounds like sort of uh, destroying it for the purposes of disposal. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any, any additional questions? Seeing none, thank you. Next, we will go to Jonathan Berard. And while we're doing Thank that, uh, Representative Casey, would you like your votes recorded in the affirmative? Yes, please, without objection. So ordered. Jonathan, mm -hmm. you may proceed with your testimony. Great. Thank you, Chair Solomon and members of the committee. My name is John Berard. I am the Rhode Island State Director at Clean Water Action. I speak today on behalf of our nearly 20,000 members here in Rhode Island, and uh, Clean Water Action strongly opposes H5446. I submitted written testimony with more extensive remarks, but tonight I want to talk about two specific things that this bill will do and one that it won't do. Uh, or sorry, two that it won't do and one that it will do should it be passed. First, it will not alleviate waste management burdens for Rhode Island municipalities. Towns and cities will still be responsible for the collection transport of these products, just as they are now. In fact, they will ha there will have to be an extra step to sort collected items that will go to, uh, to the MRF for traditional recycling and those that will go to these so-called advanced recycling facilities plus additional costs associated with transportation, tipping fees, and fines that result from diverted loads. When we talk to recycling coordinators and solid waste managers here in Rhode Island, the thing we hear over and over is that they are already struggling to keep up with the waste they are dealing with now and the cost for contaminated, contaminated recycling. Second, this will not solve our litter and plastic pollution problem. The permitting of these facilities will not prevent littering. They will not prevent plastic from being blown out of recycling bins. They will not prevent accidental spillage when the contents of a recycling cart or dumpster is emptied into a truck. They will not prevent any plastic that ends up outside of the waste stream from ending up in our environment, our neighborhoods, and our waterways. And now for what it will do. It will make both of these problems worse. This bill is being brought forward by the petrochemical industry not because they are sincerely trying to help us solve our plastic pollution crisis or extend the life of our landfill. They are bringing this bill forward because they have the wagons hitched to increase plastic production, which they are forecasting to triple from current rates by 2050, as a way of finding something to do with all of the oil and the gas they plan to extract as the global economy turns to renewable energy. These facilities are expensive to operate and require a steady stream of plastics to feed the beast. This means more plastics entering the economy, eventually to be collected, sorted, and shipped by Rhode Island towns and cities, and more nuisance plastic pollution in our communities in Narragansett Bay. The industry is trying to externalize the environmental, social, and economic costs of this growing mess that they plan to continue to saddle us with. If you have a busted pipe in your home and your basement is flooding, it doesn't matter how many pumps you have or how new or flashy or advanced they are, your basement is still going to continue to fill with water until you turn it off at the source. Likewise, recycling is not the solution for our plastic problem, whether we are talking about mechanical recycling like you have at the MRF 
or the, quote, advanced processes being pushed by industry. Our solutions lie upstream by turning off the stream of unnecessary plastics from ever ending up in our economy in the first place through source reduction and extended producer responsibility laws, both of which this body has passed uh, over the past decade or so, not downstream at the end of the pipe. For years, industry has pushed this narrative and blamed end users for the system's failure, placing blame on municipalities and people that don't recycle properly or make, quote, irresponsible decisions. This is a tactic right out of the tobacco industry playbook, and we cannot be allowed to fall for it anymore. Clean Water Action, along with our members, strongly oppose this bill, and we thank the chair and the members of this committee for their consideration of these concerns of our members. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, John. Uh, next, we will go to Kevin Boudris from the Conservation Law Foundation. Kevin, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Action, Kevin, if, Kevin, if you could shut off the background noise. Thank you. You, you, may pre you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Solomon, and thank you, members of the committee. My name is Kevin Boudris, and I work for Conservation Law Foundation, or CLF. CLF strongly opposes House Bill 5446. I've submitted written testimony, uh, and I'd like to highlight just a few important concerns with respect to this bill. Um, I appreciate Representative Bone's interest in addressing unrecyclable plastics and waste, but the practical effect of this bill would be to worsen our plastics problem by opening Rhode Island's doors to dangerous, polluting, climate-damaging technologies like gasification and paralysis. With respect to Representative Bone, these technologies do involve burning. They effectively take incineration and split it into two parts. First, you expose plastics to high temperatures to turn them into fuel. Then you burn the fuel. The vast majority of facilities that have ever employed paralysis or gasification create fuel to be burned. They do not generate waxes. They do not generate new plastics. The toxic impact of these facilities is the same as incineration. The facilities and the fuels they generate re release climate-damaging gases, along with particulate matter, lead, mercury, sulfur, and dioxins. The data on those emissions are well established at this point. The single-use plastics that burned also contain a host of dangerous additives, including endocrine disruptors and PFAS, or per- and polyfluoral alkyl substances. And Rhode Island is on the cusp of passing the hugely important act on climate, and the General Assembly is once again considering bills that would limit single-use plastics and address PFAS con contamination. This bill would fly in the face of those efforts. Burning plastic is climate damaging, toxic, and it undermines efforts to reduce single-use plastics. I'd also like to point out that so-called plastic-to-plastic paralysis, called, often called chemical recycling or advanced recycling, remains largely a myth. Again, the vast majority of these facilities are used to generate fuel, plastic-derived fuel, which is then burned. And on the job creation front, these types of high-heat technology generate far fewer jobs than recycling and reuse systems. As um, Mr. Berard mentioned, we have the safe tools at our disposal now to drastically reduce plastics and waste. This bill would only mean more single-use plastic, more fossil fuels in our lives. It is not the solution to the plastics problem. The only solution to the plastics problem is to turn off the tap. Burning plastics only makes the problems worse. Again, CLF opposes House Bill 5446. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Vice Chair Caldwell. Hi, Kevin. It's Justine Caldwell. How are you? I'm doing well. Oh, How are you, Beth Caldwell? Good, good thanks. Um, so earlier, I don't know if you heard somebody testify that these processes and what they're talking about here are very different than the medical waste facility that was being proposed um, in West Warwick and East Greenwich, but when I'm reading this, these processes seem very similar to me. Can you tell us if there is a difference between them, or are they, or, or are they the same? Uh, the processes are indeed very similar. So uh, the, the med recycler facility in West Warwick is proposing to use paralysis to treat medical waste. Uh, among the technologies men specifically mentioned in this bill is paralysis. Now, the feedstock, so to speak, is different. MedRecycler wants to use paralysis on medical waste, and this bill specifically mentions using paralysis, gasification, etc., on plastics. But it's important to point out that when it comes 
to uh, creating fuel again using pyrolysis. One of the biggest problems is using plastic. Uh, one, of, one of the significant concerns with the med recycler facility is that medical waste is about 25% plastic. And the fuels that you generate using pyrolysis from plastic uh, contain high levels of sulfur and can result in particulate, dangerous particulate emissions and high levels of carbon dioxide. That's concerned when you're using 25% plastic. When you're using 100% plastic in the process, the, the, the concerns are only amplified. So again, different feedstock, but same, pro, uh, same process and same baseline concerns when it comes to climate, environmental, and public health impacts. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next, we will go to Joan, Panich uh, Joan Panichis Milas on behalf of the American Chemistry Council. All right, um, next we'll go to Dave McLaughlin from Clean Ocean Access. Dave, you may proceed with your testimony. Dave, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Solomon and the Committee of the House Corporations Committee. My name is Dave McLaughlin. I'm the Executive Director of an environmental group called Clean Ocean Access. We work predominantly in Newport County, but we certainly care about the whole state of Rhode Island. We, uh, we oppose the entitled legislation H4, H5446. Uh, as, as, as Kevin and John had mentioned, the state is at an incredible point of taking action on climate, and this bill really flies in the face of uh, supporting the ideas of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I know that it was mentioned earlier that this could have a minor harm on the environment, but certainly if it was to scale to size, it would and therefore have a much larger harm on the environment. Uh, I think the point is absolutely true that complex plastics are hard to be recycled, but the solution for complex plastics that have been made by multi-billion dollar entities and corporations should be to redesign those materials to make them so that they're not as complicated. The solution shouldn't be at the end of the pipe. It should be using the great minds of this country to redesign those materials. Uh, unfortunately, Big Plastic has set in motion big promises when it comes to recycling material over the years, and we really need to make sure that they're held accountable, that these are, things are done, and that we're not coming up with these ad hoc solutions at the end of the pipe. Uh, Certainly proactive solutions that have been mentioned, such as source reduction, but ultimately extended producer responsibility is where the responsibility needs to lie. Uh, I agree with the, the, the comments that people in Rhode Island do not want this. The problem of plastics littering our shoreline, our bay, our watershed, and the ocean's health is something that has to be addressed. It's about stopping this from becoming a bigger problem. Uh, and I know that the, the terminology in the... In the uh, legislation here references about changing the definition of solid waste and it kind of flirts with the idea that it might not be incineration but these things belong within the, the purview and the responsibility of the Rhode Island Resource Recovery Corporation. We all have a vested interest to make sure that we come up with the best solution for the next landfill and the state of the, the waste in, in, in our community uh, whether it's 2034 or 2040 that day is coming, and I think that we should be looking to Rhode Island Resource Recovery to be the lead entity to be exploring what options we should be concerning with reducing the amount of waste that's impacting our environment. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony. Uh, we certainly do not support this legislation, but we do support working together to come up with the best solution to some of these harder questions. Uh, appreciate your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll go back to Joan Milas on behalf of the American Chemistry Council. Joan, you're before the House Committee on Corporations. You may proceed with your testimony. Um, thank you, and good evening, Chairman Solomon and members of the Corporations Committee. My name is Joan Panichis Milas. Um, I know many of you. Some of you I don't. Um, so with this new format, I wanted to, first of all, um, introduce myself or reintroduce myself. Um, I have represented American Chemistry Council for over 25 years, and I look forward to working with the committee 
and, um, and the legislature on this issue and many others. Because of the short time frame, I just wanted to mention a few things that the industry has chosen Rhode Island as a number one priority um, to hopefully um, create a facility like this. Obviously, our neighboring states are chomping at the bit to once again take something from Rhode Island that they can do themselves. It would be the only facility as, thus far in the New England states. The states that have passed this are Florida, Wisconsin, Georgia, Iowa, Tennessee, Texas, Ohio, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Um, and the, and the facility would draw regionally. It would be a regional facility, and the revenue for the state in a, reg, in a circular economy would be close to $40 million. Um, we have in-depth information that we're more than happy to share with the committee, with policy, with any of the legislators. Craig Cookson, who is the omniscient one on this subject, is available at any time to answer any questions to qualify and clarify any um, testimony that has been given that has um, created any confusion for you, and we'd be happy to work with you. My contact information is available. Um, so, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your consideration, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you for your testimony, Joan. Are there any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, we thank have, you, Chairman. We have received written testimony from the Rhode Island Business Coalition in favor. Uh, We've received written testimony in favor also from Braven Environmental, uh, the Rhode Island Farm Bureau, Flexible Packaging Association, Printing United Alliance, and the American Chemistry Council. We received a written testimony against from Clean Ocean Access, DEM, Clean Water Action, Audubon Society of Rhode Island, the CLF, and Jennifer Weeding. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 5446. Uh, next, we will go to Representative Edwards' bill, 5963, regarding the inspection of automobile, uh, uh, motor, vehicle, motor vehicles. Representative Edwards. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much for uh, fitting me in early, Chairman. I appreciate it. This bill is very, very simple and very straightforward. If you currently have uh, a car that is leased and your car is inspected, or your vehicle is inspected, um, and that term ends, what happens currently is the leasing company would have to get that car reinspected if you if you were going to buy it. What this bill does, if you are going to be the person buying your vehicle back from the leasing company and it has a valid uh, inspection sticker on it, it does not have to be reinspected. Very simple, very straightforward, Chairman. Thank you. Are there any questions for Representative Edwards? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. We have received a written testimony in favor from the Department of Motor Vehicles, and that concludes the, the hearing on House Bill 5963. Next, uh, I will pass the gavel over to my Vice Chair Caldwell, uh, who will take the next bill. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we'll move on to House Bill 6052 by Representative Barrows. It's an act relating to insurance, and it provides for insurance coverage for the loss of use of a rental, rental motor vehicle, provided that the rental car company can establish that their rental vehicle sustained damage and that the rental vehicle will require repair or is a total loss. Is Representative Barrows with us? Yes, I am, uh, oh. Jill. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Representative. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, uh, this bill would provide insurance coverage for the loss of use of a rental motor vehicle. Back in 2004, the General Assembly passed a law which allowed renters of a motor vehicle to use the existing insurance policy on their personal vehicles um, to cover any damage to the vehicles that they rented. Um, the way renters would not, this way that renters would not have to purchase a separate type of insurance um, from a rental company or an insurance company in order to rent a vehicle. When a, when a renter damages a rental vehicle, uh, their personal auto policy is supposed to provide coverage for it. Uh, there has been confusion among some insurance companies as to uh, how and what is covered. Um, this bill clarifies the law in two ways. First, um, it explains when loss of use may be recovered. When a rental vehicle is damaged, 
the downtown of the vehicle while it's being repaired is called the loss of use. This is the time when the vehicle cannot be rented because it's out of service. Insurance company recognizes, some insurance companies recognizing this and some may you know, some cover and some don't. So the second part of uh, that, that this thing will clarify is that coverage applies to not only collision but comprehensive uh, types of losses. Um, almost, although most company um, provide this coverage, some will not. So if you're driving down the street, say a tractor trailer kicks up a rock and smashes into your windshield and of your rental car, some companies will refuse to cover it. Uh, this is also clarified if you have your uh, rental vehicle park and someone happens to to key it. Um, this bill, uh, just to wrap it up, because I'm sure there's other folks out there who may be able to speak more intelligently on the bill than I am, but um, this is a good consumer protection bill that clarifies the, uh, the coverage a renter is entitled to so that the next time you travel and rent a vehicle, you are you can be confident that you do not have to buy in any type of different insurance or excessive type of coverage. Um, and not only that, I think the, this this bill um, was passed on several occasions, I'm, I should say several, but said two separate uh, occasions, uh, both by the House and Senate, and it just uh, kind of sat on the governor's desk. So um, it's a good uh, consumer protection bill, and I urge your consideration of this. But I'm sure that would end my uh, comment. Thank you, Representative. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to our witnesses. It looks like we have eight witnesses uh, for this bill, and the first one is Frank O'Brien from the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Hi, Frank. Frank? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Can you just turn your volume down behind you? I well, I was just trying to listen to the sponsor since yeah. they can't hear it on the air. <laughs> I know. Uh, this is Justine Caldwell. You're before uh, the House Committee on Corporations, and you can proceed with your testimony. Oh, thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Sorry about the uh, colloquy there. Uh, so thank you very much for allowing me to testify uh, today. Uh, I was just wrapping up listening to the, the sponsor of the legislation. So uh, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, uh, this is an extremely controversial piece of legislation. It is a piece of legislation that has a, a long history uh, in the state. Uh, it has been vetoed, well, vetoed once by Governor Raimondo, and uh, the very next year uh, it sat on the desk uh, and was not transmitted to the governor because uh, she indicated to the General Assembly that uh, she intended to veto it again. And that particular bill is almost an exact duplicate of the particular piece of legislation that was uh, that has been filed and is before you. Um, it looks like uh, this is the particular hill that... Uh, the auto body industry has decided that Frank O'Brien is going to die on for this particular session. Uh, it is a piece of legislation that the auto body industry and rental car industry will say is nothing other than a clarification. Uh, unfortunately, from our point of view, it is a clarification that will essentially mean the transfer of millions of dollars in claims that we in the insurance industry do not believe are appropriate. When a rental car company rents a vehicle, they usually have a fleet of vehicles, and insurers typically ask for a utilization rate. That is, how many of your vehicles go out, how many stay in, and the theory behind it is that if you have 100 vehicles and you're only renting 50, you're not uh, getting revenue on 50. So it reduces the, the economic loss. We have uh, submitted extensive written testimony on this. Uh, we 
have a unique uh, rental car statute in the state. Uh, it works well for consumers. It works well for us. Uh, President Pro Tem uh, Kennedy was uh, the, the sponsor of that particular piece of legislation and the drafter of it. Unfortunately, what we are finding now, however, is that there are some unscrupulous renters, unscrupulous companies that are taking advantage of it. In this particular area, we have seen a great deal of fraud, and it is something that continues to add to the cost of insurance in Rhode Island. Automobile insurance in Rhode Island is expensive. No matter who you look at, whether you look at the Zebra, Nerd Wallet, the NAIC, or anything else, Rhode Island is always in the top ten and sometimes in the top five of the most expensive states in the country. The only way that we're going to get this under control is if we take costs out of the system. This particular bill adds costs to the system. It benefits the few and it hurts the many. With that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Frank. We uh, all get our very strange hills to die on up here sometimes, so I empathize. Uh, are there any questions from the committee for Frank? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to our next witness, who is... Okay. Okay, great. So that uh, concludes our verbal testimony on this bill. Uh, for written testimony, uh, we have a, uh, against the bill from Amica, Progressive Auto Insurance, Allstate, uh, the Casualty Insurance, and uh, NAMIC. Uh, written testimony for the bill, we have Bald Hill Renters, DNH Auto and Truck Renters, Unlimited Car Rental Inc., Reliable Rental and Leasing, and Central Auto Rentals. And with that, that will include the hearing on House Bill H6052. Okay, so the next bill we will go to is House Bill 5957 by Representative Stephen Lima. This is an act relating to motor vehicle and other vehicles insurance rates. Representative thank Lima. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, this bill here is one that, um, as we know, many insurance companies use a credit-based insurance, um, a, a credit score-based insurance to, to get your rates. Um, what this bill would do is prevent that from using your credit score. Um, it would really work on components such as your driving record, demographics, um, where you live, the things other than credit score to affect what your rate would be. Uh, seven other states have already banned the use of credit-based insurance, including uh, California, Hawaii, Maryland, our neighbors in Massachusetts, Michigan, Oregon, and Utah. So this bill would simply just get us back to not using credit because, as you'll know, with COVID hitting, uh, credit has been an issue for a lot of people, and it shouldn't hit them even harder to get uh, insurance for the car as well. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for the sponsor, Representative Potter? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And not a question. I just want to thank Representative Lima. I think this is a, especially a really good piece of legislation and um, definitely in support of it. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any additional questions? Seeing none, we will go first to Frank O'Brien from the American Property Casual Casualty Insurance. Frank, you may proceed with your testimony. Frank? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And good evening, everyone. Again, for the record, my name is Frank O'Brien, and I represent the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. Um, APCIA writes about 65% of the automobile insurance sold in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, we're speaking to you today in opposition to uh, this measure. Our credit-based insurance scores are an accurate and fair predictor of, of risk. Uh, also, Rhode Island has some of the strongest consumer protections in the country. Uh, protections that have been emulated by 
a number of other states. And the passage of this particular bill in its current form would be highly disruptive to the insurance marketplace in Rhode Island. It would result in a significant number of Rhode Island consumers seeing an increase in their insurance rates and a more limited number seeing uh, somewhat of a decrease. Insurers utilize credit scores because as a data-driven industry, we know that there is a direct correlation between how well a person's uh, credit score is or whether it's good or bad, and that, our data shows, also translates into driving. Uh, through the years, we've been able to produce uh, data and statistics through the use of telematics so that we're able to show that, for example, uh, people who break hard, which is one of the uh, most dangerous uh, types of driving behaviors that uh, we measure, uh, those type of folks tend, on average, to have credit scores that are lower than others. We are have been able to show through statistical analysis that there is a direct correlation uh, between that. In addition, every uh, study that has uh, come across uh, uh, and looked at this issue from a public policy perspective has indicated that uh, the use of credit scores is, is beneficial is effective and is useful for consumers. The most recent of these uh, was done by your colleagues in the state of Vermont uh, about five years ago. Uh, Vermont is not, uh, is, is well known as a progressive state. Uh, took a very hard look at this practice and as a result of the study produced by the insurance department in Vermont decided to uh, take action in the form of putting in place the type of consumer protections that Rhode Island has had in place uh, for years. Uh, thank you. In this day and age, however, we know that uh, there's considerable scrutiny on the use of credit scores, there's considerable scrutiny on the issue of fairness, uh, both in terms of insurance as well as in terms of the practices on the part of a larger business community. And a number of states across the country are taking a look at this issue. Um, I would uh, differ slightly from uh, the sponsor in terms of the number of states that are banning this practice. Currently, three states ban it, Hawaii, Massachusetts and California. A couple of additional states, Maryland and Michigan, restrict it but do not ban it. And there are two states, Nevada and uh, Washington State, which have taken regulatory action to limit or severely restrict the ability of insurers to use uh, pandemic-related uh, credit information moving forward. Uh, the Washington State situation is, is particularly interesting because in Washington State they have an elected insurance commissioner and a piece of legislation to ban the use of credit scoring did not pass in the state legislature. It was amended uh, so as to uh, comport with some of the provisions of the Rhode Island statute. Uh, that wasn't good enough for the commissioner and the commissioner has recently issued a regulation seeking to ban the use of credit scores for uh, the next three years, Thank an you. action which has understandably infuriated the legislature. Frank, Frank, I know Representative Phillips has a question. If you can, you can wrap up um, and we can get to some questions for you. With that, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative Phillips. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chair. Good evening, Frank. How are you today? Good evening, Rep. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, how do you justify the insurance company's stance with the situation that we currently are in with the pandemic? I personally know quite a few people that have had their credit scores lowered 
because either he was laid off for a little while or something else happened. That's question number one. And then I'll let um, I'll wait for you to answer, and then I'll ask give you follow-ups. Sure, uh, and thank you for the question. I think it's an excellent question, uh, and it is a question that's on the minds of many folks. Uh, and I have I have two two ways to answer that. Uh, first, uh, first rep, we have not seen the type of decrease in credit scores that. Uh, many folks have expected. Uh, what we are seeing is similar to what happened during the Great Recession, is that people are maintaining their credit scores, um, are reducing uh, their uh, debt, are basically able to take the steps needed to manage their finances appropriately. Uh, and this is not surprising. We've actually, and I've I've provided information regarding this in my written comments, and I, I would note that uh, the average credit score nationwide has hit a record high uh, during the course of this pandemic, which is actually, to be honest with you, kind of counterintuitive. Uh, in addition to that, I would point out that here in Rhode Island, we have some very specific protections for what we call extraordinary life circumstances. And these are protections that are in the statute that allow or would require an insurer to take into account uh, things such as metal, medical expenses, loss of employment, uh, things like that. And I've also pointed those provisions out in my written statement as well. Would those provisions also uh, take into account um fraud or misreporting on the credit bureau um, side uh, you know how would you look at that if somebody's saying something's on my report that's not ours or uh, we've had fraud pro um, produced against us so our credit score is is um, lowered because somebody opened a credit card in our name and racked up all this charge accounts and then haven't paid it at all would that take into consideration what you would just said we're talking about there are a number of ways that that particular situation could be taken into account. Uh, one of the ways is outside of the insurance mechanism is that all of the uh, credit reporting agencies have mechanisms for that kind of reporting. The other thing that could take place, and this is specific to Rhode Island, and again, it's something that I've noted in, in my testimony, is that in Rhode Island, an insurer may not cancel non-renew or increase a rate based solely on a worsening insurance score unless a worsening score was due to bankruptcy, tax lien, garnishment, foreclosure, or judgment. Um, and there, so we're pretty restricted in what we're, what we could do in that particular type of regard. And, you know, uh, particularly for those folks who work with an independent agent, uh, the independent agency system uh, provides a mechanism for folks to uh, to come in to uh, explain the situation and uh, to have something taken into account. We don't want people hurt because somebody has perpetrated a fraud against them. Okay, and I think you just pretty much answered my last question, but my last I'm going to ask it again just in case you didn't fully un uh, answer it. Is there any recourse besides the independent insurance agent that you were, agencies that you were just mentioning that the customers can say, you, low, you raised my rate because my credit score is lowered and I disagree with it. What type of recourse do the consumers have? Well, we wouldn't be able to do that under current reliance statute. Under current reliance statute, we're able to set the rate and the way the current statute is written is that uh, in subsequent years, if your, consume, if your credit score improves, uh, we can, you can take advantage of your improved credit score. However, if your credit score has deteriorated uh, under the statute and under the regulations currently in place, 
uh, we can't take that into account. Okay, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. Uh, any further questions for Frank? Uh, Representative Fenton Fung. Thank you, Madam Vice uh, Chair. Hi, Frank, how you doing? Good. Can you hear good, me? Good, Great. Rep, how are you? Good. So I have a question for you. On You mentioned that Hawaii, Massachusetts, and California, if I got those three states correct, those were the three that have completely outlawed this process, correct? That is correct. Okay. How long has that been in effect? Forever. Uh, there, one of the things that um, is interesting about this particular, uh, the use of credit scoring and credit-based insurance scores by insurance companies is that uh, with the exception of some regulatory actions recently taken, uh, no state has ever sought fit to ban the use of credit scoring via legislation once it started as a practice. Uh, California and Massachusetts, the two states that I'm most familiar with, uh, both have or had unique auto insurance regulatory systems, both of which severely restrict the rating and underwriting factors that insurance companies can, can utilize. And so credit scoring was never allowed in either of those two states. I'm sorry, Rep, I'm not as familiar with the uh, situation in Hawaii as I am in the two main That's That's all right. I'll give you some slack on that one. Um, and, and I apologize, I, this is not my wheelhouse. Um, are, on the whole, are those two states' insurance rates significantly higher than Rhode Island's? Um, Massachusetts, the latest statistics that I have seen, Massachusetts is lower than Rhode Island's. Uh, and that there's a lot of reasons for that, including uh, mm. the fact that uh, auto repair costs and other costs here in Rhode Island are much more significant than uh, in Massachusetts. In California, uh, California is uh, they're around. Uh, Rhode Island might be a tad more expensive or a tad less expensive. But obviously, California California's a much different system, much bigger state. Uh, it's a little bit of apples and oranges. Uh, but insurance is expensive in California as well. I appreciate that. And I just I want to follow up one more thing while we have you here on what Rep. Phillips was saying. When we're talking about fraud, I, obviously, you've probably seen the headlines with how much um, fraud happened in the unemployment insurance uh, system during the pandemic and whatnot. Are you saying that under current state statute, you couldn't take into consideration the fact that that was just a completely fraudulent situation that might have hurt somebody's credit score? What I am saying is that if somebody's credit score has deteriorated, we can't take the fact that their credit score has deteriorated. It wouldn't hurt them, I guess is what I'm saying in, in English, because under the statute, we can only change somebody's insurance rate based upon a credit-based insurance score if their score improves. If their score is lowered for whatever reason under current statute in Rhode Island, it wouldn't hurt the consumer. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to point, study from it. From an insurance that. rate <laughs> okay. point of view, I should add. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering all that. Um, can you just identify which statute that is that you want to be able to lower it? Uh, So the statutes that, <laughs> there are two statutes, section 27-653 and 27-956, and there are three regulations, insurance regulations 1625 and 116. The citations to all of that stuff is in my statement, Mr. Chairman. Great, thank you. I think Representative Potter has a question. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Frank. Um, a couple quick questions for you. One, I'm going to assume that you don't have any uh, background in the actuary process of this, um, but you've, you've certainly spoken quite a bit in, in, in more detail than I would expect just somebody representing um, the, the insurance companies would be. But how familiar are you with that actuary process? Um, 
rep, I went to law school because I couldn't handle the math, so <laughs> I talk to actuaries. I don't pretend to be one. All right. <laughs> so fair, I'll try to do my best. Fair, fair enough, Frank. I wonder if you just might know, or maybe you can forward me the information after the fact. Um, I mean, when you say that you know a low credit score is indicative and an accurate and fair predictor of the risk associated with it, how much more likely is it across the board that somebody with a low credit score is is uh, more probable to to you know be an at-risk driver? Rep, I, I can provide you and the rest of the committee with a one pager on that very subject, so I'd be happy to do that. Okay, because my, my concern with that is I imagine that there's probably a lot of variables that go into it and there's a lot of overlap with people who are either low income or uh, credit challenged or potentially just live in cities. And I think there's, again, a ton of over, overlap with a lot of different dynamics and variables that you can attribute it to. But I'd really be curious to see you know, something as direct as um, you know, when you said people who break hard have, have lower credit scores. I would think people who break hard typically have worse driving records, too, and that would be more of a, an in, indication that, you know, they're, they're higher risk drivers, more so than, than just the direct correlation to the credit score. So I'd be interested in looking at any of that data if you have it available. Happy to. And, and, and I would add that one of the other provisions in the statute is that, um, Credit score, your credit based insurance score can't be the sole determinant of the rate. So, what insurers do is they take into account uh, a lot of different factors. And we believe that the more factors that we're able to take into account, uh, consistent with public policy, because you as legislators and the General Assembly sets what we can use and what we can't use from a matter of public policy we're able to take into account all those things and come up with a better rate. And I imagine you don't have uh, much much in the indication um, on how much the credit score specifically is what factors into that overall profile, do you? That varies from company to company and that information is uh, closely held. Uh, you know, there there are a wide variety of companies in uh, the marketplace here in Rhode Island, and there are some companies that don't use credit scoring um, at all. Um, you know, one of the things is is that we have a number of companies that, in the insurance world, we call it telematics, and that is basically we put a device on your car or we use your smartphone and we're able to measure and monitor how you drive. Uh, the gold standard from an insurance company would be if we were able to monitor and measure how you drive. But not everybody is comfortable with having an insurance company monitor their driving behavior. It's understandable. Questions about Big Brother and everything else. So, but if someone is more comfortable with that as opposed to having their, having a credit-based insurance score or other underwriting factors, there are options for consumers out there in the marketplace. And I'm sorry, just one more question. I'm sorry to belabor the point, but as you've testified, you've, you've just prompted me to have a few more questions. So one last thing, um, and then if I have anything else, we can certainly take it offline after the fact, but um, do you know which companies those are that do not factor in credit scores? Uh, I believe, well, there's one company that I'm aware of that does business in Rhode Island it's called, is, is Root. Uh, I can't give you another, uh, well, I mean, Progressive Insurance, for example, if you use Progressive's uh, uh, telematics option, uh, it does not take into account credit scoring. You're, you're going to have to... You're going to have to give me a mulligan on that one because I'm not, I'm talking off the top of the head, my head and perhaps I shouldn't. No, no problem. Thank you for your testimony, Frank. Uh, Frank, I think Representative Phillips has another question. Yeah, as a follow-up for what Representative Potter had said in your answer to him, you said that the it's very closely held for the insurance company is that how much what percentage of the credit score is built into the complete. Um, credit data for the setting of rates, is that correct? Yes. So you have no clue from any of these companies, even though you represent the industry, 
as to how they rate the um, rate the the um, consumer or customer for their insurance itself for the cars. Well, let me. I I have knowledge generally, and and, and let me let me make a couple of three points on, on that particular uh, subject, Rep. If I may, first. Uh, they are all competitors, and um, as an independent entity, for antitrust reasons, I'm not a repository of some of the more sensitive competitive information that they utilize. Second, uh, in Rhode Island, as well as everywhere else, insurers need to file their rating plans with the Department of Business Regulation. They are reviewed. They are reviewed by actuaries. Uh, and if there are any changes that need to be made, uh, DVR will require insurer uh, to make those changes. And then finally, again, going back to statute, uh, in Rhode Island, as in a number of states, uh, your credit-based insurance score can't be the sole determinant. There has to be other factors that go into the overall rate-setting decision. Okay, but you, they can weigh it at fifty percent, let's say, instead of a twenty. Another company at twenty percent, correct? Uh, companies are all over the lot, rep. Okay, and the last question is going to be: Do you know? Do they use all three credit bureaus, or is there one specific credit bureau that the insurance industry uses to um, to use for the credit score? Uh, I'm sorry, rep. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, thank you, Frank. I think uh, Deputy Speaker Chairman, Charlene Lima has a question. Oh, yes, yeah, Charlene, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. I didn't know if you could see it I, on the computer. I didn't. Chairman um, Solomon had to point it out to me. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no problem. Hi, Frank. How are you? Very good, Deputy Speaker. Uh, good to hear you. Look forward, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Look forward to I miss the lobbyists and all the people, too. Um, Frank, how long in Rhode Island um, have insurance companies been using credit scores as part of their decision-making on the rate? Well, uh, I guess I'll answer it this way, uh, Rep. The... Uh, some of the statutes that I refer to were first put in place by the General Assembly uh, uh, 2012, uh, it, it, close to two decades, if not a little over. So you're saying approximately since 2012, eight, nine years? Or earlier than that, I, I, why don't we just say it, it's been in use in Rhode Island and nationally for probably 20 years. Okay. Um, there, there are a lot of credit errors, and 90% of bad credit is due to job loss, medical condition, or divorce. And I want to bring someone up because I had similar legislation in like this, and uh, this woman is the top administrative assistant. And it was her husband who wrecked her credit. He ended up getting divorced. She was not aware of what he was doing. And she tried to fix it. It's so hard to fix. I mean, even when you have identity theft to fix your credit, uh, she did try to do that. So what I'd like to know is how many of these innocent victims have been able to either fix or appeal it, what percent of your consumers were successful in getting their rates lowered because it was either fraud or one of these other incidents? I'm sorry, Rep. I don't have that information uh, as extensively as I prepare for this hearing. It's not a question that I anticipated. I'm sorry. But in regards to the specific situation that that you mentioned, uh, there are a number of uh, so-called extraordinary life circumstances that are covered under the statute in the regulations. Uh, I think it's it's fair to say that 
there could be other extraordinary life circumstances, such as uh, the one that you just articulated, that would be worthy of consideration by this committee and the General Assembly in terms of possible modifications to the statute? Oh, good. So you wouldn't have objection to putting something to address this woman's concerns in there? That's great. I, I think it, you know, Madam uh, Rep and members of the committee, um, it may not seem like it, but we try to be fair and we try to make sure that the rates that we set are, are appropriate and uh, we believe that there are a number of instances in the statute already that uh, would take care of that sort of situation, but if there are things that need to be fixed in order to provide additional consumer protection while at the same time allowing us to use uh, one of the most effective tools that we have to predict and manage loss, then we would look forward to working with the committee. Thank you, Frank. Okay, any further questions for Frank? Seeing none, uh, Frank, thank you so much for taking our questions tonight. We appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have Isaiah Tobias Lee on the phone. Great. All right. Up next, we have Randall Rose. Are you with us, Randall? Not yet. Okay. Hi, Randall. It's Justine Caldwell. How are you? Hello. Um, hello. Representative Caldwell, thank you. Um, um, is this for the um, insurance rating bill um, yeah. for the credit rating? Yes, it's House Bill 5957. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, so it's no... Um, the basic framework of insurance is is that um, the state requires people to the state requires insurance companies to set rates um, every every state um, every state makes restrictions on how insurance companies can set rates to ins and the idea behind that is to be fair to consumers. Um, it's not always implemented that way in practice, but the idea of regulating how insurance companies set rates is to make sure that um, consumers pay a fair rate um, because the government is requiring the cons consumers to buy this insurance. Um, now, setting rates based on um, based on a person's credit history is just not fair. Um, there's a weak correlation between credit history and the likelihood of getting into accidents, but it's only a weak correlation. They have not, um, I've read through the testimony by the supporters of um, using credit rating from the insurance companies, and none of them give any specifics on how, any numbers on how strong the correlation is. Um, the, um, it's only a weak correlation. There are plenty of people who have bad credit rating who are, um, are not risky drivers or vice versa. Um, and it, um, when they allow, when credit rating is allowed to be used as a standard, people are going to be charged unfairly. Um, they're going to be charged um, as if they were risky drivers when they're not. And there's another reason why insurance companies want to use credit rating um, to set rates, which has not been acknowledged. Um, in, um, in unregulated industries, um, you want to, um, you want to, if you're a business, you want to um, make sure that the people who pay high prices are the people who are less prudent at managing money, um, because if someone's less prudent at managing money, um, they're less likely to um, complain about their rates, they're less likely to shop around, um, and um, using used when there is a correlation between having a bad credit rating and not being prudent at managing money. So um, when insurance companies um, set higher rates to the people who have bad credit ratings, even if they may be perfectly good drivers, um, that's advantageous for the insurers as a business because um, it means that they're imposing the higher rates of people um, who may not um, be um, smart consumers, and um, it allows them to um, it allows them to um, impose 
um, rates that um, on that subpopulation um, without a likelihood that the these consumers will um, notice the problem, complain to their representatives in the government, and so on. Um, these are the people who are most likely not to raise a protest over higher rates. Um, and that shouldn't be allowed. Um, the ins- car insurance market should be um, priced in a fair way, um, and especially since it's one of the very few products that the government requires everybody to buy whether they want it or not. Um, so it's, um, I know the insurers can say that, um, that some of the time people with worse credit rates um, cratings are, bit, are bit worse drivers, but by no means is that always true. And um, uh, speak, they may claim that um, with, without giving details, they claim that um, using credit ratings um, as, a, um, as a standard for setting rates um, allows some people to pay lower rates um, and some people to pay higher rates. But personally speaking, as a consumer, I don't want to pay slightly lower rates if it means that they're um, charging other people um, a higher rate unfairly for something that has nothing to do with their driving ability um, when Thank people you. may have had a bad credit rating of no fault of their own. Thank you, and um, you can't know whether you're going to get lower Thank rates or you, higher Randall. rates from this, but I'm against it. Randall. Thank you. Thank you so much. Could you stay on the line for us? Because you yes, are sir. actually the first witness in our our next bill. I'm just going to read off the written witnesses uh, for this bill. So okay, can, sure. you, Thank can you. you stay on the line? Thank you so much. Okay. Yes. Uh, so for 5957, we have testimony in favor from the ACLU, from Temple Fawcett, and from Jordan Goyat. We have testimony against um, from the APCIA. Uh, from the Independent Insurance Agents of Rhode Island, from Allstate, from Progressive, from Jen Hurst, from the Consumer Data Industry Association, from NAMIC, and from State Farm. And we have amendments from DBR. And that will conclude the hearing on House Bill 5957. All right, next bill we will go to is House Bill 5959 by Chairman Shanley. This act would create the Rhode Island Transparency and Privacy Protection Act to require online service providers and commercial websites that collect, store, and sell personally identifiable information to disclose what categories of personally identifiable information they collect and to what third parties they sell the information. This act does not prohibit the collection or sale of personally identifiable information, does not require the retention or disclosure of personally identifiable information by online service providers or commercial websites. Uh, the first witness we have on it is uh, Randall Rose. And Randall, I would just ask if you could limit your testimony to about a minute and a half because the last witness went a little bit over. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I am in support of the bill, um, but, um, and it is, it's, it does not have any um, tough effect. All it does is it, it intends to give consumers more information about um, what info the websites and apps are collecting about you, what types of info, and what types of companies they share it with, which is harmless and it's um, to the companies and very good for consumers because a lot of consumers worry about information um, being gathered about them online. Um, the, um, there are lots of um, worthwhile ideas in how the bill is drafted. I do have one concern about it, um, which is that um, the definition of personally identifiable information is um, way too narrow. Um, and the bill says that, that companies have to disclose um, various facts about how they share personally identifiable information, um, but um, Sharing, as long as the sharing of personally identifiable information is done over an encrypted in, um, connection, this bill will not treat that as sharing personally identifiable information. And if it's, um, so this, the companies can easily evade any kind of disclosure under this bill by simply selling your information to another company, but transmitting that information over an encrypted connection, and then after it's transmitted over an encrypted connection, it can be unencrypted, um, so companies get all the information about you, but it isn't counted as personally identifiable information because it's been transmitted over an encrypted connection. Um, and um, it's also in, um, information that's shared about you um, 
based on your email address without explicitly giving your name um, can, um, is not covered by this bill. If a company sells information by your online behavior, it's fine if your email address that doesn't include your name, um, then that nothing has to be disclosed under this bill. It, it, it evades the entire bill in that case. Um, and um, the, um, it is dangerous when companies share information about you um, they, um, tied to your email address, even if your name's not included, um, because it's easy to use other databases to look up your name. They, um, for the recipient company, the company that receives that information about your behavior tied to your email address, that recipient company can look up your name based on your email address in a different database. Thank you. Um, so I'm concerned about some of the loopholes in the bill, but I still think there's a lot of good in how the bill was designed, um, and I do support it. I just wish it was tighter. Great. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any uh, questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony, Randall. Uh, we've received written testimony against from the Rhode Island Business Coalition, the Internet Association, TechNet, Temple, Fa uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we've received written testimony in favor from Temple Fawcett, we received written testimony against from the Hospitality Association, America's Health Insurance Plans, the State Privacy and Security Coalition, and then we've received written testimony from the ACLU requesting an amendment, as well as the Rhode Island Bakers Association requesting an amendment. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 5959. Next, we will go to House Bill 5960 by Representative Place, who's been patiently waiting over there. Uh, this bill would this bill would establish an occupational regulatory framework for by authorizing the issuance of occupational licenses and government certifications by recognition for qualified worker applicants from other states. Representative, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You did a very good job of describing the bill. Uh, again, to summarize, what this in essence does would allow the state of Rhode Island to issue regula regulations that would permit, say, a doctor who lives in Massachusetts to easily start to practice in Rhode Island. Um, same thing with any myriad of uh, professional licensure requirements. In some cases, there are states that do not have a particular licensure requirement. Rhode Island does. It also allows a person moving to Rhode Island who's actually done the work for three years or more to, again, easily transfer to Rhode Island and become a productive member of society. Um, Again, the legislation does speak for itself. It's just, in essence, it's not quite a reciprocity piece of legislation. It just allows us to recognize the effort people have done in other states to acquire professional licensures or, in some cases, the actual work they've done for many years in a particular field. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for the sponsor, Representative, uh, Fen Representative Fenton Fung? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you so much, Brett Place, for putting this in. I know it's kind of mirrors some of the stuff you've been working on with the Department of Defense, so I, I appreciate that greatly. My question here is kind of the same question I brought up back then when we were hearing that bill, is page three, line 19. Um, it talks about if somebody's worked for three years in this occupation, um, especially in the medical fields, if they worked in the field three years, 15, 20 years ago. I think it's just, it's one little piece of thing that I would try to tighten up on that. Things have changed, and I bet in a lot of other different industries that would be a thing, because I, I could see somebody, like, you know, coming back again to have a second career. I just, it, that one line seems to stick out, especially for us in healthcare. But otherwise, thank you so much for introducing this. Chair Phillips. Thank you, Chairman. Representative Place, the only question I have is, and this has come up a couple of times in the years past, is, what happens with an occupational license if our requirements is much higher to obtain the license than the municipality or state that the person is moving in from? I think we'd probably have to look at, look at I think that would cause us to have to look at our requirements. <clears throat> because if we're putting a higher burden on our citizens to enter a field in other states, I think that that would be, that was something we'd have to turn around and look at. Uh, again, if, if you've been in the field successfully for a year without being sued, I mean, I, I think it shows some effort that you're competent at what you're doing. 
again, I, this is this is brand new legislation. There's there's definitely areas. It was uh, model legislation. I quite frankly found online that I just I really like because I think it's something we need to do as a small state. And if we as a small state are putting greater requirements on, say than say Massachusetts or Connecticut or especially a neighbor, um, <clears throat> we're hurting. We're just we're just hurting our own people. And the idea that somehow we know better than our neighbors or, or other states in the country, I think we'd have to, you know, again, take a solid look at that and understand that it's probably not the case. Well, I, I, one that came up in the years past, the reason, one of the reasons was because we put a higher qualification on safety in that from, than other states might. And a lot of the trades, you know, say we, they need to have so many more hours of instruction or apprenticeship or, or whichever to obtain their license and that compared to other states. So I'm just curious what was going to happen if we are much higher requirements in the state they're coming from. I don't want to see somebody get hurt coming into our state if, if they uh, wouldn't be able to pass the exam or be able to come up to the stature that we have. Quite frankly, the, um, well, I won't say quite frankly, the employers that they are, are at the end of the day responsible for the safety requirements within their particular place of business. Um, our you know, federal government recognizes that. I think we do the same thing from, from a local standpoint. So I think the employers are going to be a tool in that area to make sure that those people are brought up to speed fast. Uh, uh, Whip Kazarian. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was just curious, does this also apply to uh, attorneys? I know that Rhode Island has one of the toughest bar exams uh, in the country. I just didn't know. It, it, it actually there. exempts attorneys. Okay. Uh, it actually said, it, uh, I couldn't tell you the specific line, but it does state that uh, anything that is, any licensure that is controlled by the Supreme Court, I believe, of the state. Okay. I think that is the line that uh, controls the, the attorney qualifications. Okay. Thank you. When I'm finished testifying, on the rest of the bills, I can go back through and I'll point it out to you specifically. If you're that would be great. Thank you. A representative Place, is this from the Council of State Governments or the NCSL? I, I honestly don't remember. Um, I've got, what is it? Uh, Institute for Justice has been my primary source for a lot of this model legislation. So they do a lot of work in licensure reform and things of that nature. So they've been my primary source for a lot of this legislation. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? the sponsor. Hearing none, uh, that concludes the testimony on House Bill 5960. Next, we will go to House Bill 5918 by Representative Place. All right, so House Bill 5918. Um, not very often, study commission is a, is a good word. I think in this case, sitting down with, uh, with our staff attorney, I think it is a good word. What this, legisl what this allows is a study commission to look at how can we provide benefits to people in the gig economy, and I should say traditional employment benefits to people in the gig economy and who are self-employed. We found in, during, this, during this last bout, last, last year or so, that there are a lot of people out there that just don't have access to traditional benefits, namely unemployment is the, the most obvious one, but also group health insurance and things of that nature. And what I'd like to do is put together a study commission and look at the best way to come to provide those benefits. You've seen other states like California have gone what I think is a very draconian way and rewritten their laws to make almost everybody an employee. And you've seen them have to go back and take based, I mean, quite frankly, they've had to go back and re rewrite the law because Uber and Lyft and those companies have provided enough political pressure to get them to do that. So they went in and they, they, they changed their laws, thought they were doing a good thing. But at the end of the day, they, they wind up hurting a lot of the people they were intended to help. You know, a lot of these people are staff writers for different news, news organizations. They're, they just do data input. Or they are the, get the traditional gig worker. They're driving for Lyft. They're driving for Uber. And when you go in and, and you go as draconian as California did, you have a detrimental impact on your economy and the people you originally thought you were going to help, it doesn't work out that way. The, un the unintended consequences uh, really come back and kick you in the butt. So I'd like to take a really good serious look at this. I've got, I think I've got some pretty good ideas of how to go about it. Mutual insurance companies and things like that, that is owned by 
the, the people that are actually involved in them. Again, I'm not the be all end all on this and I would definitely like to see the state of Rhode Island take a look at this, especially given the last year where we had to um, you know, adjust rules and regulations to allow those self-employed people to get access to traditional benefits. Thank you. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, uh, we have received testimony in favor from Temple Fawcett, and that concludes the hearing on House Bill 5918. Uh, next up, we have House Bill 5917 by Representative Place regarding pupil transportation drivers. Would you like to explain your bill, Representative, please? Um, in essence, what this allows, it, this is a continuation or a codification of an executive order the executive branch passed uh, in order to deal with the uh, COVID-related emergencies. It allows uh, those licensed in Connecticut and in, in Massachusetts and vehicles that are registered in Connecticut and Massachusetts to augment our bus, bus services. Um, I know specifically DATCO, which uh, provides the transportation for Boroughville, has had a hard time trying to find drivers. And even when they started to move back into full-time lear in-person learning, they still had a hard time finding people in order to provide the, the, the bus driving services. So this would allow companies to go ahead and cross level across state lines. Uh, and again, it's just a codification of executive order that uh, Governor Raimondo in initially initiated. And I believe, and I, well, I don't want to say Governor McKee is extended because I don't, I can't say that definitively, but I'm sure at some point he will be extending it. But it, it's, it's just, uh, again, a codification. I think it's a good idea. Again, we're a small state. We're not the be all end all. And a lot of times our, our licensure regulations have a detrimental impact, not only on the people that live here, but on the businesses that do that actually operate in in the state as well. Thank you. Are there any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, we have received written testimony from the Department of Motor Vehicles expressing concerns with the legislation as currently drafted. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 5917. Next, we will go to House Bill 5962 by Representative Constantino. Uh, this act would provide that a lessee of a motor vehicle purchases the vehicle within one year of the lease inception or any renewal thereof shall be exempt from certain registration transfer provisions. We have received written testimony from the Department of Motor Vehicles against this bill and that concludes the hearing on House Bill 5962. Next we will go to House Bill 5961 by Vice Chair O'Brien. This would establish the player a self-exclusion program within the state lottery division with any winnings collected from the self-excluded person to be used by the Rhode Island Council on Problem Gambling for its use for research, education, and prevention of teenage gambling addiction. Uh, we have nobody signed up to testify on this bill. We have received uh, a written testimony in favor from Temple Fawcett, and we've received a written testimony against from the Rhode Island Department of Revenue, the lottery division. And that concludes the hearing on House Bill 5961. Last up, we have House Bill 5965 by Representative Price. This would uh, authorize the ex Exeter Town Sergeant or designees to conduct Division of Motor Vehicle Vehicle Identifying Number in odometer inspections. Uh, we've received written testimony in favor from Bill Donovan, the Exeter Town Sergeant, as well as the Department of Motor Vehicles. And that concludes the hearing on House Bill 5965. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Made, uh, made and seconded. We are adjourned. Thank you.